Well, good evening, everybody. It's a joy to see you all for our first evangelism training. Um, Travis and I have discussed what we're what we're uh, thinking about doing, and uh, so far we have three weeks worth of training planned out. So I'm going to be teaching tonight, and then next week, next Lord's Day evening, and then Travis is going to teach the third week on uh, on open air preaching. This week and next week, I'll be teaching on evangelism and apologetics. Uh, and we might end up doing more if Travis uh, wants to say more. There's, that's what it was funny he mentioned even this afternoon. There's, you know, evangelism. The subject is so wide that you could you could fill up. Uh, oh, you're fine. You could fill up a uh, full year's worth of teaching. You might say, uh, and and that's certainly true. But uh, we'll we'll try to keep it succinct and simple because this is really simple. Uh, don't don't get overwhelmed. That's that's the biggest thing I, I want to give you tonight. Please do not get overwhelmed with sharing the gospel with people. Don't get overwhelmed with evangelism because it's actually, in its very essence, not complicated and not complex. It's actually very simple. It starts to get intricate. I think that's a better word when you get into the details of how to deal with somebody in conversation and how to deal with uh, an atheist's objections and things of the like. There's a, there's there's some details, but overall. The concepts are very broad. So that's really what I want to introduce this evening is some more broad ideas and talk about a couple of practical things as well. Uh, but before we do that, of course, let's go to the Lord in prayer, asking that he would bless our time of teaching. And one other thing, too, before I pray is this is different than preaching, even though it's hard for me to talk any other way than the way I normally do. So please don't think of it as really preaching. It's more of teaching. And I mean that in the sense of it's much more um, uh, lacking formality in that I want you to interrupt me. If you have a question... If you have a comment, Travis, if you have something you want to add, please feel the freedom to, to add in because this is really more of a conversation, we could say. So uh, please look at this as more informal and have the freedom and raise your hand if you want to have a question about something. Because like I said, I'm going to get into some the nitty-gritty aspects of conversation especially. So you know, if you think, well, what happens if they say this in the conversation or what happens if I don't know this answer, please ask me. Uh, and if I don't know, I'll point you somewhere that uh, you'll get the answer, you know, whether it be some teacher or, or I'll say I'll get back to you. Um, I have an extensive list. Mike knows about it. An extensive list of things to do. And if you have a question, I'll put it on there. Find out the answer and get back to you. So anyways, let's go to the Lord in prayer, asking he bless his time as we meet together. Father, we, we ask that you would bless uh, the teaching that has brought this evening, uh, that we as a church, as a, as a, as a local body of believers are equipped, um, that we are strengthened, that we are given the tools necessary to go out into the world and to proclaim the gospel, the good news of Christ, to this lost, to this dying, to this decaying, um, to this wicked world that is headed for destruction. Father, I pray uh, for my brethren that they would be filled with joy, that they would not... Um, that they would not uh, as it were, be filled with uh, a sense of being overwhelmed because these things really, in their essence, are simple. And I pray that they would, they would walk away this evening with that, uh, with that understanding. And I pray that, uh, again, that, that we would, um, as a group, be equipped and that, and that in our being equipped, in our, in our knowing how to deal with the unbeliever, how to share the gospel with the unbeliever, that Christ is glorified. We pray ultimately that that's, that's, our, that's our goal as a church, that's our goal as believers individually, to glorify the Lord who graciously and lovingly laid down himself for us. And so we say all these things, we pray through him, uh, we, pr we pray to you through him, knowing that he has been appointed as our mediator, and there is no other, and we rejoice. And so we say these things in his name. Amen. Amen. Um, one of the most unfortunate things I've seen in the short time that I've been in ministry, uh, and even just a Christian, is that I that I, I see it all the time. A lot of believers don't have the tools. They have not been given the tools necessary to effectively share the gospel, and even to do so with confidence. That's one of the one of the saddest things I think is that it's not even that I, I don't encounter Christians who don't know how to share the gospel, but they don't feel confident. And they know the gospel. They believe the gospel, but they have not even been told. Uh, or, or shown how to effectively do that in conversation or even as I'm going to touch on later in open air preaching or things like that. It's all the same. It's all the same. We're sharing the gospel. And so that's the goal of this training. We do not want you all to feel that way. And it's not something we ought to cower uh, in, in light of. In fact, uh, there, are, there are different personalities in this church. 
God has equipped uh, certain of us with different personality traits. And some of us are a little bit more social than others. Some of us are a little bit more, uh, the term is introverted. You know, we, we maybe enjoy a little bit more time alone. But we are all called, to an extent, to be extroverts for the gospel. We are called to die to, uh, to shyness for the gospel. We are called to die to, uh, to avoiding awkward situations. Because let me tell you, sharing the gospel can become awkward at times. You can put yourself in some awkward situations, and you will always interact with awkward people. In fact, that's one of the things that my mom was telling me in the car the other day. She was talking about something about um, avoiding awkward people. And I thought, Mom, to, vi- to, sh- to go out and to share the gospel, to do any sort of ministry is to interact with, with awkward people. So we go on the streets. Keep that in mind as well. We, we want to avoid those things, but rather uh, we must sometimes embrace the, the path of most resistance. And that certainly is the path of sharing the gospel. And uh, so what we're going to look at this evening, we're going we're gonna to cover three main ideas, three, three main uh, points, you could say. One is we're going to look at the essence of evangelism. What is evangelism in its essence? And then we're going to look at evangelism and conversation, uh, and we're going to get very, some very practical. I'm going to walk you through step-by-step step what I always go through to share the gospel with someone in a conversation. And then lastly, I'm going to touch a little bit on evangelism through open-air preaching, but Travis will do that much more thoroughly uh, coming soon. So let's look at the first one. Let's consider um, what is the essence of evangelism. And this is where I want you to, uh, to let go of your sense of being overwhelmed. Because here's, here's what evangelism is. Telling the world that Jesus Christ saves sinners. That is evangelism. It is to evangelize, to share the good news of the gospel. In fact, uh, I was speaking with a brother recently. And uh, we were talking about uh, being equipped to share the gospel. And I said, do you believe the gospel? I said, do you believe that Jesus came into the world, that he died for sinners, that he rose again, and that all who believe in him are saved? And he said, yeah. And I said, you got all you need. You have everything you need. You know, there's a sense in which Travis and I want to equip you all, but also, if you're a Christian, you have everything you, you will ever need to share the gospel because you've believed it already. You've accepted it. You've received it. Uh, Paul talks about the gospel message in 1 Corinthians 15. That's where we'll turn to just for a moment because I want us to remember and to remind ourselves that the message of the gospel isn't just uh, as generic as Jesus saves sinners, but it goes even more specific than that. And it covers the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. So 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in the uh, first verse of that chapter, the Apostle Paul writes this. He says, Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preach to you. So what's he doing? What's Paul doing? Oddly enough, he's sharing the gospel with Christians. He's he's bringing to their remembrance the message that he had initially brought to the church at Corinth. He says, which also you received. So they are equipped. They already have what they need. And which also you stand. If you are in Christ today, brethren, what? We stand in that same gospel. That's the gospel that we cling to daily. And then he says, verse 2, by which also you are saved If you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Verse 3, this is what I really want to highlight. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. And then in verse 5, all the way down to verse uh, verse 11, Paul talks about the different appearances of Christ post uh, uh, post death, his, his uh, po- I should say post resurrection appearances of Christ. Uh, but there it is, verse 3 and 4. The gospel in its simplicity is that Jesus Christ came to die for sinners and he was raised on the third day. That's the gospel message. Now, however, when we go to evangelize, there is more that we have to say. There is more that we have to say to sinners than just that. For if I was to approach the, the unbeliever, if I was to approach the sinner, and I was to say, Jesus Christ came to save sinners. And they're not convinced that they're a sinner. What good does that do them? It doesn't do them any good. And this is why I've talked about this before. The necessity that people understand the character of God and of the law. And that's why the law is, uh, is the best friend to the gospel. They are sisters. They beautifully complement one another. And, and we'll look at that even more in detail when I go to talk about conversation Uh, how to share the gospel in conversation. But when you look at the gospel, it has to have a context around it. And the context that surrounds the gospel message that Christ died for sinners 
is the, the context of that is that we are sinners in the hands of an angry God. I mean, I think we, especially if you just start in Genesis chapter 1, you go all the way through to Revelation, you can walk away with that fact that man is um, by default, by birth. He is born in a state of sin. Uh, Psalm 51, David says, In sin my mother conceived me, not just from birth, but from conception. Travis and Meredith, they're expecting a child. The child's already a sinner. They're already a God-hater. And they need to be born again, uh, just like we all do. Because that's the default position, because they're, they're what? They're in Adam. They're not in Christ by default. They're in Adam. And they need to be transferred under uh, the headship of Christ. And sinners need to be brought this truth. Before they're brought the good news of the gospel, they have to know the bad news. In fact, if you could think of it, that's a great way to think of it. Bad news and good news. The bad news comes first, always. That God is holy. God is righteous. Yes, God is gracious. God is merciful. But God is a consuming fire. That's Deuteronomy 30. God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. Uh, we saw at the end of, uh, there's a portion in Leviticus where Aaron's sons go to offer up strange fire before the Lord. And what that meant is basically they had accepted it. They had offered a sacrifice that was unacceptable. They did it wrongly. And you know what it says it happened? Fire from heaven came down and consumed them both. So God is a holy God. We see it in the, in the revelation of his law, his character. And sinners need, to be, sinners need to understand this if they are to appreciate Christ, as it were. If they are to understand that Jesus came into the world to save sinners. You know, when Paul said that, when Paul said Jesus came into the world to save sinners, he said this also, among whom I am foremost. It doesn't mean anything until the sinner can say that. It doesn't mean anything until the unbeliever can say, I am the, the chieftain of sinners. I'm the leader of sinners. And then the gospel is precious because it says that Christ died for sin. And so there's that. There's that aspect to the gospel message. That the bad news ought to come first. That we are on our way to hell, but God has made provision in Christ for those who believe upon him. But then after the presentation of the gospel, there's also what we would maybe call the gospel, the gospel call or the, uh, the application of the gospel. See, it doesn't, you know, I mentioned there in 1 Corinthians 15, that's the essence of it, but there's also an application. Okay, Jesus died for sinners. Jesus rose again. What's it? What do I do? What, or we could say in the words of the Philippian jailer, what must I do to be saved? Okay, I understand Jesus is the Savior. Jesus is the Redeemer of God's elect. But what, what must I do to, to, to take part in his benefits? And we know that the, 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 the response is what flowed from the mouth of the Lord Jesus in Mark 1 when he said, repent and believe in the gospel. It is repentance, turning from sin, turning to God in saving faith. And the sinner receives forgiveness of sin. And they receive the righteousness of Christ imputed to them by faith. And God sees them as righteous in his sight. So that's a little bit of an expanded gospel. But remember, in its essence, it is to exalt Christ. In fact, any time, you know, we, when, when, when we go to share the gospel with people, and you're going to find this, you fail every time. You, you walk away saying, I wish I had said this, I wish I had said that. As long as Christ has been proclaimed, just as we talked about this morning, we saw here that Paul talks about uh, those, those hypocrites preaching Christ. But preaching Christ is the very essence of the gospel. He himself is the good news. So even if you do it, even if you do it falsely and you misspeak and oh, you, oh, that wasn't a correct verse reference or whatever, as long as the Lord Jesus Christ has been exalted, God has, will bless it. God will bless the, the preached word. So that's the essence of evangelism, uh, to bring to the world the good news of Christ. And you all probably knew that, so that's a little bit of just a, a debriefer. Uh, you could say a reminder. And, uh, you know, we always have to remind ourselves. It's interesting. I preach the gospel to myself every day because I every day forget it. And I every day uh, am prone to, to leave it. In fact, Martin Luther said, I preach justification by faith to my people every week because they forget it every week. <laughs> and um, it's true. I know you guys forget it every week because I forget it every day. And so you're going to hear it a lot. You're going to hear a lot of redundancy. But it's because Scripture is also redundant on this point um, of the gospel. It's all about the gospel message. Anyways, so let's look at that second thing now. This is what we're going to spend a little bit more time with. Hopefully we'll get some questions. Please feel free to interrupt me. Like I said, I'm, I'm in this, stuck in this modus operandi of preaching mode, but I'm trying to tone it down a little bit and be as relaxed as I can. Um, <laughs> so sharing the gospel in conversation. I, Travis, please. <laughs> I, I, play, have mercy on me, guys. I, I, I really appreciate it. Um, I just, I so did. Preaching is, is my chief delight. really is. It's a joy. But... Um, when it comes, like I said, to conversations, sharing the gospel with somebody, and I'll, I'll, I'll contextualize this for you. I'll put it in a real-world situation. If I were to encounter somebody on the street, how would it go? 
How would a conversation go? And this is a good model. And this is a model that uh, I didn't come up with. This is a model that I learned from other men and uh, took things from other men here and there, took things from Scripture. This is scripturally based. We're going to walk through a couple of Scriptures as well, Lord willing. But usually the conversation starts uh, something to this effect of, um, I will ask the sinner, I'll ask the person I'm addressing, I don't know if they're a believer or really, if they're not a believer, not sure. Um, I'll just simply ask them, what do you believe happens after someone dies? And you want to ask a question like this. One of the reasons you want to ask a question like this is because it's kind of pr- provocative. But also it, it's inquiring of them. You, you want to, uh, if you're ever sharing the gospel with someone, it's not that you want to, um, you want to be like a salesman. I, I wouldn't say that because there's a, there's a subtle deception, I think, with some salesmen. But you want, to, um, you want to be persuasive. Paul talks about persuading men. You want to talk in such a way that it, it makes them want to continue to talk with you. Don't come across, uh, don't come across necessarily even as, as if you're preaching to them. Because it's not, it's a conversation. In fact, really, you ought to come across initially, especially, that you want to hear from them. Uh, I think one of the greatest tips my father ever taught me about conversation was he always said, you have to learn to listen. And I was always the one who talked too much in our family growing up, really. I was always disciplined for talking too much. And I was always given my, they would say, Lucas, you've reached your word limit for the day. They really would. So, I mean, it's amazing in God's providence, God God's called me to preach. But uh, it's been a, it is a great struggle for me not to talk when I'm talking to people in conversation. It's always, I'm always having to check myself and tell myself to stop, to stop and listen. So thankfully, a lot of that had to do with my father teaching me, keep your mouth shut, look him in the eye, and listen to everything they say. Everything. So, and that's a great tip when you go into sharing the gospel with someone. In fact, I would say, first, listen to everything they want to tell you. Just, just start off with something spiritual, like I mentioned. What, what do you think happens if someone dies? And then just let them spill the beans. Because people love to give their opinions, don't, don't we? We just love, especially if someone comes up to them, what do you think about this? And you're like, oh, I'm high and mighty. You know, I'm, like a, I'm the wise man. I'm Socrates or somebody. I'm Plato. I'm, I'm, you know, people are searching my wisdom. So, and, and, and let them feel that way because we do care what they believe. What they believe affects their soul. I want to hear what they believe. I really do. And it's intricacies. So come to them and say, what, or you could even uh, phrase it, what, what, do you believe in God? What do you believe about God? There's different ways you can start out a conversation. But I always like to start off with that phrase, uh, what do you think happens after someone dies, due to the fact that that already sets the tone for what we're going to talk about, and that's death. Scripture talks about the unbeliever is a slave to the fear of death. You know, as Christians, we don't fear death. We don't have to. Christ has put death to death. Um, and so, and that's ultimately what I'm trying to deal with them about is the day of their death, the day in which they'll die. You know, I, I want to deal with them about the day when they're going to stand before God. Are they going to be clothed in Christ's righteousness or are they going to be seen as, as a filthy sinner? Um, and so I want to keep that as the tone of the conversation. So I'll, I'll, I'll ask that question. And uh, then Pandora's box is opened. Uh, the myriads of, of, of ideas and theologies are going to run at you at full speed. This is a part where you also do not need to get overwhelmed. You don't have to know every belief system in the world to be an evangelist or to, be, to, to share the gospel. I certainly don't. I mean, I'm uneducated. I don't know much. I really don't. Um, but the little I do know is that I don't have to know about all of those world, world views. So you may hear them say, well, I believe in, uh, I, I'm a Hare Krishna or uh, I'm a Buddhist or uh, I'm a, I'm a Muslim. Those are very rare. Those are all very Eastern. You're not going to encounter a lot of people here in South Carolina like that. Usually it'll be, guess what? It's probably going to be someone who says, I believe in Jesus Christ, and when I die, I'm going to go to heaven. That's probably going to be um, a common response you'll get. Also, atheism is becoming very popular, so you'll, you'll probably get some atheists or agnostics. That's a huge one. That's probably bigger than atheism. People just don't know, and honestly, they don't care because they're, they're concerned with this life. They're concerned with the pleasures of this world. So, Again, those are some things that you'll be hit with. Don't worry. Do not worry. Let them, let them say what they want to say. Let them present. Their, if maybe, they're a, maybe they're a Mormon or a Jehovah's Witness. And guess what? Christian, they probably know more than you. They probably do. They probably know more than the Bible than I do. They study diligently. Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses specifically, they know their Bible. They really do. And they know their theology. They're super strict. Everybody has to know. And they're always evangelizing. So don't... Don't, but don't let that be intimidating because, listen, they know all that, but it's lies. <laughs> they know a lot, but it's a lot of lies. And you may say, well, I, I know little. Is it true? Okay, you know a little truth. It's better than a lot of lies. 
So let that also, and they're, they're going to maybe even try to impress you with their Bible skills and throw in verse references, this and that, and they'll start talking about the Greek and, and uh, you know, all these different Greek constructions and this and that. And you're like, did you study Greek? You know what? Don't. Don't let that throw you off. So you'll hear a lot in reply to that simple question. What do you believe that happens after someone dies? So from there, the next comment, uh, next question I like to ask usually when I'm dealing with the unbeliever is something of the effect of... Uh, if you were to stand before God, and, and I, I, I always make assumption, and we're, I'll talk about this a lot next week, about presuppositionalism as a form of apologetics. That's a whole other subject. But I assume the God of glory is real. When you share the gospel with people, do not, assume, do not step off your worldview, brethren. Do not abandon your Christian worldview. We, there's only one correct worldview. You know that? It's our worldview. It's the biblical worldview. Do, when you're dealing with an unbeliever, don't say, if God is real, if Jesus died, he did die, and God is real. He is. He's the Lord of glory. He is Lord and King. They are rebels and they're, they're rejecting his lordship. Don't ever, don't ever say, if Jesus is Lord, I know Jesus is Lord. Otherwise, I wouldn't throw my life away on his behalf. Throwing my life away according to the world. I wouldn't follow him if he, if he was real or if he wasn't. It's not a contingency in our minds. It's true. It's settled. So when you're dealing with an unbeliever, uh, avoid saying things like that, or perhaps you know. Imagine, if you will, you know, God is is real. Assume it in conversation. Say, well, you know what? The Bible says God is holy, God is true, and if you die and you stand before God tonight, and God judges you based off of His law, will you be innocent or guilty? Will you uh, will you go to heaven or not? And then this this is where you can begin uh, to open up the aspect of the conversation, like I just mentioned, that you start with what the bad. News. So you move into conversation, and they'll usually give you an answer, but it doesn't matter really what the answer is because you just, again, direct it right back to this. You say, God is holy. God is righteous. Um, you can give an example of the Old Testament like that, like the story out of Leviticus. Maybe something that you, you, know, you enjoy, um, or maybe a story of Isaiah and Isaiah 6. This is where you can actually use your own, uh, you can pick your flavor, you, it, it, but it's still the same contents being, being brought to their attention. So you want to remind them and to show them the character of God. That's where you start. The gospel always starts with what? Character of God. The gospel continues through with the character of God and it ends on the character of God. It's all about God. It's the story of God, you could say, the epic of our God. So you start with that. Like I mentioned, you say, uh, what do you believe happens after someone dies? They give their whole spill. Then you ask them if you stand before God and uh, he judges you based off of the Ten Commandments, would you be innocent or guilty? And based off of their, like I said, their response, then you can go into explaining about the character of God, who God is. Um, and um, I mention his grace. I talk about God's mercy. Uh, I talk about how God's attributes are in unison with one another, that they're not at war with one another. That's, that's one of the things, especially here in the South. People have this very warped view of God. You'll see this. Of they think of God as like a cosmic grandpa. That he's not really wrathful and he's not angry. He's definitely gracious and he loves everybody. And that's that's kind of that's the that's the view of God. So especially if that's their response, you know, well, God is just going to forgive. Me. He'll let me. He'll let me slide. He knows my heart. It's like, oh man, he's going to condemn you because he knows your heart. Um, you know, remind them of the character of God. Show them who God is. And uh, this is a good uh, point where you can memorize maybe a couple scriptures on it. You know, like Deuteronomy, uh, I think it's thirty-five, uh, chapter thirty, verse five. Uh, the Lord our God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. Super small verse, very easy to memorize. And I hope I got that, that, uh, that cross-reference correct. Um, and then you move on after that to the law of God. This is, again, this is the essence of the bad news. Because you have God is perfect. God gave a perfect law. And Travis has been teaching through the law of God. So our youth should really know it. We'll quiz them on it. Um, of the Ten Commandments, that is the law of God. That is God's standard of judgment. That is God's standard of justice. Let me get this one here. It's okay if it goes down. Um, and that is God's standard of righteousness. So we bring to their attention the law of God. Let's, let's look at a verse for this so we can really get this idea drilled into our heads from Paul himself in Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. In 
In verse 19 is where we're going to look at. It says, Why the law then? It was added because of transgressions. Having been ordained through angels by the agency of a mediator until the seed would come to whom the promise had been made. In verse 21. Now the law, is the law then contrary to the promises of God? May it never be. For if a law had been given which was able to impart life, then righteousness would indeed have been based on the law. Verse 22, but the scripture has shut up everyone under sin. Now scripture's there, and remember this, scripture's there, that's that's really referencing the law, the scripture's concerning the law of God. And Paul talks about this also in uh, Romans 3, that the law of God is, is there for a specific purpose, and it's to bring about the knowledge of sin. It's to, it's to inform our consciences. That's why Paul says here that it has shut up everyone under sin, as it were. In other words, that we realize, thou shalt not lie. I'm a liar. Thou shalt not steal. I'm a, I'm a thief. Thou shalt not blaspheme. I blaspheme God, and so on and so forth. And so in conversation, it would look something like this. I mentioned, I I, I say, you know, what happens after you die? They give their spill. Uh, And then I say, you know, okay, knowing God is holy and knowing that uh, God judges based off of his Ten Commandments, would you be innocent or would you be guilty? They say, I don't know about God. Let's just say, I don't know about the God of the Bible. I say, well, the God of the Bible is holy. That means he's set apart. He hates what's evil. He's righteous. He does what is good. He is gracious and he is merciful. Yes, in fact, he's merciful and you can see it right now because there's, there's, there's air in your lungs. There's blood pumping through your veins. God is sustaining your life in his grace. But God gave his law, his law just like we have laws here on this earth and I can use that as an analogy. You know, very helpful when you're sharing the gospel to bring down these spiritual ideas and put them in the real world in, in an analogy. That's what our Lord did so masterfully. So, you know, with the law, you could say, uh, we have speeding laws, you know, when you're in your car and you ought to follow them. And if you break them, you're going to be punished. Same way with God's law. You know, if God says you shall not lie or steal or blaspheme, God holds people accountable when they break his law. Or you could bring up adultery. They say, I've never committed adultery. And then you go into the New Testament, you can bring to their attention what Jesus says about adultery. If you look with lust, you've committed adultery in the heart. And you can bring that even further and say, listen, friend, guess what? God doesn't just look at the outward acts. He looks at the inward man. He looks at your heart. So what am I, again, what, what's going on in the conversation? I'm showing them who God is, the nature of his law, what he has said in his law. And then I'm, sh- I'm really encouraging them to self-scrutinize, to self-examine in light of the law of God. Think of the law of God like this. It's a mirror. It's a mirror. You, know, you look at the mirror to see how, how dirty you are. In fact, in the morning, sometimes I get a good night's rest and I wake up and I just feel great. You know, you're know, like, I'm ready to take on the day. And you get up and you go in the bathroom, you look in the mirror and you're like, I'm not ready to take on the day. I don't look as good as I thought I did. And it's, it's very, very much so with the law of God. We are self-confident uh, by default as sinners, very self-sufficient, at least we think. And uh, that we all, we have all that we need from ourselves. And then we look at the law of God and we, we're, 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 um, we're frazzled. You know, we're, we're, we're surprised. Whoa, I'm really this bad? Yes, you are really this bad to the very core of your being. You're this wicked. So, and also, in, in so looking at the mirror of God's law, they also see another image being reflected, and that's the image of character of God. Because, you know, the law of God is really, it's just the character of God. It's just telling us who God is. I think Travis has probably beautifully shown that going through the Ten Commandments. It's showing us th- these are the things that, that protrude from the, the very uh, essence of who God is. Why is lying wrong? Because God is truth. Jesus Christ is the truth. Why is adultery wrong? Because Jesus Christ is faithful to his church. And marriage is what? A mere reflection of that. So to, to, to abandon your spouse... To betray them is to, is to fracture that image. It's really to say the gospel is untrue. And so you could draw up many conclusions about the other commands as well. And so you're showing them who God is, what his law is, and then they see who they are in light of who God is in conversation. And so like I said, it might go, you know, I say, I say those things about God. Then I say, hey, you know, have you ever heard of the Ten Commandments? Ten Commandments, here's one of them. Have you ever lied? And I'll ask them. This is very important. That you get them to self-indict. It's very important when you're dealing with the unbeliever and you're sharing the gospel with them and you're trying to give them the law, the bad news, you want them to self-indict. You want them to, to admit it themselves. And I, I have before in the past said, um, 
I know that you're a sinner because I'm a sinner. And the Bible says that all people are sinners. And I know that you've lied before and you've done these things. And, um, you know, you've probably looked with lust before. So you're an adulterer. And you know what? You're probably true, but it's much more efficient. And it's much more, uh, it's much better to strip away their spiritual pride for them to admit it themselves. So say it like, uh, pose it as a question. Uh, you see in the commandments, uh, in Exodus 20, we find you shall not lie. You ever lied before? Yeah. You ever told one lie in your life? Yeah. You ever told two? Yeah. You told five, you think? Yeah. What do you call someone who tells multiple lies consistently? You call them a liar. Well, what are you? I'm a liar. <laughs> so get them to admit it. Go with the next one. Adultery. You ever looked with lust? You ever looked at an a, a inappropriate ad? Because we live in America. You know, we're, we're just obsessed with sexual perversion. You looked at an ad or looked at a woman on an ad inappropriately or looked at pornography? Yeah. Okay. Guess what? That Bible says that those who consistently do those things are adulterers. And they will not see the kingdom of God. They're sexually immoral. And they say, yeah, I'm an adulterer. So now they've admitted to another one. You just can continue on. Uh, you can uh, do, uh, you shall worship the Lord your God only. You worship sports. You worship football. You worship this. You like shopping. Yeah, yeah. When was the last time you went to church? When was the last time you read, read your Bible? Uh, I don't do these things. That's your God. Yeah, it is. So again, pose these things as questions. You'll find that as they self-admit, they began to realize themselves really truly. As you reason with them, you, you know what you're acting like for them? You're acting like a brain for them. Because the unbelievers, their mind are, minds are so clouded by sin. It's, it's so sad, but it's true. They can't even reason spiritually. So we're there to, to gently and graciously and lovingly deal with them concerning these things. So you're showing them the law. You're asking them about these things and getting them to admit it themselves. Getting them to say, yeah, I'm a liar. I'm a thief. I'm a, I'm a blasphemer. I break the Sabbath. That's a great one to bring up. I love that, especially in, uh, in the South here because we pride ourselves as the biblical South. But... A Walmart's most busy day is the Lord's Day. What a sad thing. What a grievous thing. Um, and so that's, that's one that you can bring to their attention likewise. And that's really the essence of the bad news. Because once you get them to admit that, you can then go into conversation to bring out the logical conclusion, which is what? Well, if in light of who God is, in light of what His law has said, and in light of the fact that you've admitted to it, bring them back all the way to what you said at the beginning. You see, you always bring this back to that initial, that initial starting point. Uh, if, you, uh, were, if you stand before God tonight, if you die tonight, and God judges you based off that law that we just looked at, would you be innocent or guilty? Well, where would you go if you died today? And then they'd have to admit, you know, and you can, even, you can even pose it further. Is it heaven or is it going to be hell? It's going to be hell for me. Well, that's a scary thing. So, um, and now they've admitted it. Now they've admitted it. Your spiritual poverty. Mike and I had an opportunity to do, to do this very thing with a lady and where Shoals uh, just a couple weeks back and um, she professed to be a Christian. She gave a lot of good answers. Very thoughtful. Very nice lady. But I got her to admit. She openly admitted I'm going to hell if I die. Because I had sent all I did. It was so simple. Showed, I taught about who God is. Showed her the law. Asked her about the law. Said you broken the law? Yeah you broken the law. Yeah I broken the law. What are you going to do about your law breaking? Oh, I'm going to try better. And when people and people will say that a lot of times. People will say, oh, I'm going to try better. Or God, God's gracious. Always go back to the word. Always go back to the word of God. Remember, don't abandon our worldview. Don't abandon our worldview. So they say, oh, I'm going to try better. What does the Bible say? Our righteous deeds are like filthy rags. But also you can put it in an analogy. You can say, well, try that in a court of law. Imagine if a murderer said, well, I'm just going to try better. I promise I will not murder again. Well, that's all great, but it doesn't matter. You've still committed the crime. You got to pay the pun. You got to pay the penalty. Um, and if the, or they say God is gracious, you say, "Yeah, He's gracious," but it also says He's wrathful. <laughs> and uh, the only way those two are reconciled is what is in the cross, and we'll see that in a moment. So, in conversation, that's how that would go, uh, and then you they're they're brought to that point of admitting, "Yes, I'm lost. I'm going to go to hell." And then this is the actually this is the easy part. Because it's all just preaching. This is all. This is pu this is private preaching. And even for you women, um, I, I don't mean it in the capital P sense, you know, of preaching in a church. Um, I mean it in the in a more generic sense of proclaiming. This is where you do take the position of it's really no longer about questions. It's no longer about inquiries. It's merely you telling the story of, of the gospel. Saying, hey, guess what? God's gracious, and God has loved sinners with a love that we cannot understand. And Jesus is that. Uh, we could say, in that love, Christ came. 
And he died for sinners like you and I. He died for me. Um, one time, certain times the temptation would be for you to say, uh, maybe tell them Jesus died for you. I wouldn't do that necessarily um, because I, I, I'm very convicted on the point of, of, of limited atonement or some people call it particular redemption. That Christ only died for the elect. So I wouldn't necessarily say Jesus died for you. I would say Jesus died for sinners. And are you a sinner? Praise God. Then you are invited to come. So, um, but, but that's just a small point. So again, tell them that Jesus died for sinners. Jesus was buried. He is raised from the dead. And he lives today. And he is alive. And he is the Lord. You tell them the story of the gospel. Very simple. The one that you believe, the one that you hold on to, as Paul says there in, uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, the one that you stand in, that's what you tell them. That Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost. And then the last part is merely, again, the application. What's the application of that? I just said it earlier. Repent and believe. And that's it. You simply say, turn from your sin. Turn from your rebellion against God. Turn from your self-trust. That was one of the things the lady that Mike and I talked to on that Saturday, her name was Heidi. Very, like I said, very sweet lady. One of the, th- the, the issue with her, her, her issue was that she was self-righteous. She was self-trusting. Because I asked her, going again right to the beginning of the conversation, what, you know, if you died tonight and you stood before God and he judged you based off of his law, would you be innocent or guilty? She said, I'd be innocent. I've tried my best. I've done good things. And I think I'd be good enough. And I don't think she's really looked at the law. And so we showed her the law, and like I said, she admitted to that. So, But then, like I said, going back, you remember, and then at the end, you just merely apply it. You know, Jesus died for sinners. He purchased redemption. Do you want that redemption? If you want that redemption, turn from your sin and trust in the Savior alone. And the Bible says that you will be saved. And throughout this, it's, like I said, my strongest encouragement is that you wield the sword of the Spirit. That you grab hold of of the great sword of the Word of God, you slice through their worldview. You slice through them. The Word of God pierces hearts, changes lives. So it, you're, you're, even, even the words that you say, even the phrases you say, let them be biblical phrases. Like that, I keep saying, uh, Jesus came into the world to save sinners among whom I am foremost. That's a direct quotation from 2 Timothy. In the, I think it's 2 Timothy. And the reason being is I, I want to even to, to, to season my conversation, even my wording, to be biblical wording, because that's scripture, scriptural. So um, memorize a, a few key, like I mentioned that one about the, the God being a consuming fire. That's a great verse to memorize. Um, another verse, and this I'll, I'll throw some off the top of my head going through the whole thing. So again, start a conversation. You talk about the character of God. There's Deuteronomy 30, 30 verse 5. You can talk about God being a consuming fire. I love Nahum chapter 1. You think, Nahum? Who's ever read Nahum, right? Nahum chapter 1 is one of my favorite chapters in the Bible because it talks about God's grace, God's mercy, and God's wrath all in the same section. It's beautiful the way it does it. Because he just talks, he just says God's gracious, and he says, but he's not going to leave the guilty unpunished. And, and that's a great place to take somebody when they say, well, God's gracious. I say, listen, Nahum said the same thing, but look at what he said immediately after, directly after that. God doesn't overlook sin. He doesn't. So Nahum chapter 1 is a great verse for the character of God. Um, another great place is, uh, is, is Exodus 34, when Moses encounters the Lord on Mount Sinai. And God says, the Lord, the Lord gracious and compassionate and abounding in loving kindness and truth. Another great place is Isaiah 6. It's a wonderful place to go to. Um, and there's, there's many others. Um, and you can even do like a little study on the attributes of God and get some good verses for that. Also, verses for the law of God. Uh, when you take someone through the law of God, Exodus 20, that's where the law is given. And it's repeated also later on in Deuteronomy. It's another place you can go. Um, and also just dealing with that whole idea of condemnation in the law. Another place you can go in conversation is, uh, is Romans chapter 3, uh, Galatians chapter 3. Because again, these talk about what the law is there for. Especially Romans 3. I love Romans 3 because Paul quotes the Old Testament. So you get like a double layer of scripture, you, you know, in the sense of this is new and old testament here. So it's like a summarization of all the Bible's doctrine on total depravity. Um, and so that's a good place to go. Also, just some verses on salvation by grace is Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, Romans 4, 3, Romans 4, 5. The whole chapter of Romans 4, really, you could read. You know, that's the thing. If you ever just get stuck, just go to the word and start reading. I mean, the word will have its due course, have its due effect. So Romans 4 is a great place to read. Um, 
And, uh, and that's, a, that's another one. Um, also verses on Christ's death. Romans 3, 25 and 26. You've got uh, uh, Mark 15. I love Mark 15, 38. It talks about the veil of the temple being torn in two from top to bottom. Um, the resurrection of Christ. You can go to Matthew 28, Luke 24. You can also go to 1 Corinthians 15. I think that's one of the best verses to go to because it, that's the summarization of the gospel message there. So, And then when you go to application, um, Mark 1, 15, repent and believe the gospel. That's another great verse to memorize. Um, uh, also, there's one Acts 20. I, I just can't off the top of my head remember. Um, I'm trying to do all of this off of memory um, because I've done this so many times with people on the streets. This is tried and proven. Uh, it's been a great method for me because it, this is the biblical method. This is not something, like I said, that I conjured up that you, oh, I just said, okay, let's just start with the law and take people there. You always start with the law. You start with the character of God, then the law, then the gospel, and then application. Always. And I want to, sh- I want to show you all that very briefly in Romans. Romans chapter 3 is where we're going to go. Because I just mentioned it earlier and I want to say. And we've actually, we went through Romans. We went through like, what, 12 chapters of Romans? We went through a lot uh, a few weeks ago. And so a lot of this is just, again, bringing uh, to your attention again what we've already looked at. Romans chapter 3 uh, in verse 9. So up to this point, in, in, Paul's, uh, in Paul's letter to the Romans, he has only talked about the bad news. Only. He's talked about men's sin against God, God's wrath from heaven. He's talked about that all the way beginning in chapter 1. That people are sinners. And in chapter 1 specifically, he highlights the sin of the unbelieving world. Chapter 2, he talks about the hypocrites, the religious hypocrites, their sin before God in light of the character of God. Chapter 3, what does he say in verse 9? What then? Are we better than they? Not at all, for we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, there is not even one, there is none who understands, there is none who seeks for God. And I'm not going to read all of it, just for the sake of time. But he goes through and, and totally indicts the entire human race. He says we're all under this condemnation because we've broken the law, the law of God, the commands of God. We have acted in, in contradiction to the character of God. So that's the model. Start with the character of God, then the law of God, as Paul does so masterfully. And then what does he do in verse 21? But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested. Verse 22, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. Verse 25, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. So what do we have here? He now brings to our attention the good news of the gospel because it's precious. You know, when you go in a jewelry store and you see all the, the, the fine jewelry, they put it on. They like to put it on dark felt, like a dark felt background, because they're trying to accentuate. They're trying to show you contrast here. They're trying to show you the beauty of that jewel. And it's likewise with the gospel. People aren't going to understand its beauty until they see it in front of the background of the bad news of the law, of our condemnation before God. And uh, so Paul does that here. He shares the gospel. Chapter 4, then he brings the application. In chapter 4... Verse 4, he says, Now to the one who works, his wage is not credited as a favor, but as what is due. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. So what's the appropriate response to the gospel? It's faith. So this model of of evangelism with people is not something that um, I come up with. It's not something that is directly from Scripture. We start with God. We look at His law. We show the sinner these things. We... Merely through conversation, ask him, you know, when you die, what do you believe happens after that? What do you believe happens? What do you believe about God? Let them say what they want to say. Tell them about the character of God. Ask them about the law. Ask them those questions. Are you a liar? Have you lied? Have you stolen? Yeah, I've lied. I've stolen. You looked with lust. Yeah, you're an adulterer. That's showing them the law, showing them the bad news. Now they're convicted. Now they've admitted, yes, I'm a sinner. So if you die, you stand before God, going again back to that initial question. What are you going to say? Well, I have nothing to say because I'm a sinner. Because I've broken his law. That's correct. And a just judge, every just judge must see to it that the lawbreakers are punished. And so likewise it is with God, only more so, only more perfectly. And so they say, yes, I'm a sinner. I deserve hell. And then you can finally say, Jesus saves hell-bound sinners. And you show them that message that he died and rose again. And you tell them, here's what you must do. Turn from sin Turn to Christ. Believe upon Him. As it says, to the one who does not work, but believes in Him who justifies the ungodly. 
God is in the business of justifying ungodly people. God is in the business of treating ungodly people as if they were righteous because of His grace in Christ. So, um, I don't know if it was because of my... Um, the way I spoke, but if there's any questions, please, please, because I still got a couple more things I want to say. Please feel free to throw in a thought here or even a comment that you'd like to make. Um, perhaps a scripture that came to mind that you'd like to, to bring to our attention. But that, that is a basic, and you think, wow, it's really that easy? It really is. But you'll find it doesn't always go as beautifully as that. You'll find that you're going to go on a lot of rabbit trails. You're going to digress. They're going to say something about Joseph Smith and Mormonism, and you're going to, let's say you read... You read up on a bunch on it last week, so you're going to want to talk about Mormonism for 20 minutes. It's not, it's not always, it's not going to work out as beautifully as like what happened with me and Mike and Heidi. I mean, that was like the best conversation I've ever had in terms of sharing the gospel. It never goes that well. It's going to have bumps on the road. They're going to, they're going to try to distract you. Satan is going to distract. Think about this. We have three enemies when we're sharing the gospel, the world, the flesh, and the devil. You've got Satan who himself is always at work to thwart gospel ministry. You've got your own flesh that you're always going to be, you know, you, you're just going to be like an inward argument happening. Every time you go out to evangelize, well, ah, nah, they, they already know the gospel. Don't, don't worry. Don't try to talk to them. Or um, if you're at work trying to share the gospel with people, there's always going to be this inward fight going on between you and yourself. You're like, ah, you know, they probably already know. I don't need to share it. But then you're like, no, I do. No, I should. And then you've got the world. The world tells you you're a fool for wasting your time on these things. So we need to be, this is, this is, good. This is, a, this is the path of most resistance. But we've got to run it. We've got to walk along it. And we know that our Lord is uh, glorified when we do so. Um, so keep that in mind as well. That there's going to be distractions. But again, just go back. Go back to the character of God, the law, showing them those things, showing them the bad news, bringing them the good news, and then saying, here's what you must do to take part in it. Um, and you can even talk about when you call them to repent and believe in Christ. Talk about the cost of discipleship. Like I said, there's so much freedom um, because in different parts of the Bible it talks about different aspects. You know, there's different times in Scripture. Jesus even highlights different aspects of following him. So you could talk about, hey, you know what? You've got to leave fam- you might even have to leave family members behind to follow Jesus. You might have to leave f- friends behind. You might have to, to leave uh, a job behind. I mean, there, there's many things that go into that. Um, and so you can make application in that moment. There's a lot of freedom. There's no perfect way of doing it in the sense of uh, one way to do it right every time. It's different for each person. And you have to read that person. That's why I said, especially at the start of the conversation, that you let them tell you of themselves. Learn about them. Get their name. Where were they born? You know, how many siblings they have? You know, what are, what's their job? What are they interested in? Get to know them. Let them be your friend. Tell them. I, I love to always, when I'm sharing the gospel with people, tell them I'm, tell them friend. You know, address them as friend. Because they are my friends. Miss Heidi's my friend, you know. They, these people are people I love dearly, dearly, dearly. And I wish, honestly, I do, before God, that I, had, I, had, I could just hang out with them. Just to hang out. They just seem like nice people. Uh, I mean, I know they're sinners, but in the sense of uh, nice to fellowship with and spend time with. And we need to have that, 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 that uh, intention. That we're not here to just drop the gospel off and run away. You know, we, we, Jesus, our Lord, was what? The friend of sinners. The friend of sinners, and we likewise need to be the same. So, uh, and then lastly, I'm just going to briefly cover about open air preaching. And uh, this is for just maybe a couple minutes here who, if you have an interest in open air preaching or what, or you, you've had teaching abilities that have, been, uh, that have been used before in the past, maybe in this church or in a different church, and you're curious about open air preaching and you want to learn more, and Travis will definitely uh, very well. Um, show you more of that and scripturally how that looks and things like that later on. But just want a couple tips. Everything I said here is the exact same on open air preaching. It's the same thing. Absolutely the exact same thing. Nothing goes differently. Tell them about God, His law. That's the bad news. And who they are in light of His law. And then tell them about Christ. And then call them to repent and believe upon Him. That's it. That's all open air preaching is. You may think, wow, it's that easy? It really is. That's the essence of it. And there's much freedom as to what you want to say, again, each different time. I mean, I say different things different times. And I'm sure Travis can, can testify to that as well. So, with, with open air preaching, it's likewise the same. So, are there any questions? I guess I'll, I can just, op- maybe I can ask you one. Maybe I'll, that'll get a question or two out. Uh, if not, if you don't have a question, maybe that just means I explained it well. You know, I've, I've taught um, multiple times before and no one ever asked a question. So I figured either I scared them out of it or I, I just explained it so well, which I highly doubt that that was the, <laughs> the possibility. 
I, I got a question, and you may address it later, but uh, one thing that I thought about is when you're dealing with someone and you try to take them back to the law, if that person is, say, an atheist, they don't believe in that law, mm -hmm. how do you then shift? To it's so good. That's such a good question. So Mike asked just to repeat it to you so that I, you know that I get it. Um, he asked concerning if you're sharing the gospel with an atheist and they basically say about the law, but really even in a generic sense about anything of our faith. They say, I don't believe in any of it. Why are you, why are you addressing this to me? Um, there's so many angles you could take with that, but it's, it's all really the same in the sense of it doesn't matter what you think. <laughs> it, and and I, would never, I would never say it like that, but in the sense of... Um, you know, you could put it like, well, you know, I was speeding down the, you know, I was going 90 and a 35, and I told the cop I didn't believe in him, but I still got a ticket anyways. So, you know, you could say, and, and be, you know, all this is, is so, you want to be so gentle, because you're wounding people. We're wounding people, but then we're going to show them the healing balm of Gilead. So we're, we're, we're showing them the law of God, which is like a hammer, it shatters, but we're then going to show them the, the, the message of the gospel that soothes and heals. So um, be so gentle, very, and just filled with love. And tell, I mean, I, there's been times I just tell people, listen, I love you. I'm out here, I'm telling you this because I love you, really. Um, but anyways, I would, say, I would say that, I'd say, you know, it really doesn't matter what you think because God is the God of glory. He exists and he is Lord of all. And if still they persist, they probably will say, I don't believe in it. I say, well, um, I'm going to tell you about it anyways. And um, I'm going to tell you this message anyways. I'm going to tell you the gospel of Christ anyways. And you, and I would appeal to this, their conscience, and say, you know it to be real. You know it to be real. Because what does Paul say in Romans 1? They know God. They, even though they knew God, they abandoned that knowledge. So I would appeal to that. Say, really doesn't matter what you think. Or it really doesn't matter what you say. Because guess what? In your heart of hearts, you know. Not just you don't think. You know that the God of glory is the true God. Um, and, uh, but I, I like that a little analogy. You know, you, you pick up little things like this just from doing it a lot of times and listening to other people. You pick up things like that, the analogy of speeding in a, 30, in a 90 and a 35. You know, I can tell the cop I don't believe in him, but I'm still going to receive a penalty for breaking the law. Likewise with God, it doesn't matter if you confess him or not. It doesn't matter if you say, I believe in Jesus as Lord or not. He is Lord. So, and then I'll just continue sharing. If they don't want to share, they'll walk away and they'll stop. So never, and that's the biggest thing, never abandon your worldview. Never step off the word of God. We stand on it. And if they say, stop reading from the Bible, it's old and antiquated. They say, I, I'm getting into what I'm going to teach on next week, so I don't want to say too much. But uh, don't ever let something like that be a uh, discouragement from, um, from, uh, toward you from, for uh, getting off uh, the foundation of the word of God. And um, a lot of, even what you just said, a lot of that's going to be expanded on a lot more next week. I dedicated a whole week to it. Because there's a there's a lot of details when it comes to apologetics. So well, that's a wonderful question, though. I think one thing is don't is don't uh, get an argument kind of prove it to God. I know we have the the pretty mm -hmm. Yes. The big thing is uh, that there's a standard, and so he'll say, "Well, I don't, you know, what's what's, what's, what's right for you is not right for me, or you know, vice versa. And everybody can have their own opinion." Such thing as that. But I heard a guy, he spoke at a college and he was talking about atheism versus Christianity. He was debating a guy. And, and uh, one of the students says, Well, I just don't believe it. I just don't believe there's any standard. There's any, you know, you, you know the universal law, uh, such thing as that. And the guy said, All right, well, I'm going to go back to the dorm room with you right fast. And so he went with all the guys to his uh, suite, and all the guys are there. And the guy had his laptop, and the, um, the uh, speaker, you could have just grabbed the laptop and just ran out the room with it. He goes, wait, 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 you're still on my laptop. Well, who says? Who says that I'm still there? Mm. Mm. You have to you use things that, that and you know, it won't make them mad. You can't always be friendly. <laughs> uh, because the main thing is that everybody wants to be like God and they declare it to God. Mm. Mormon, the witness, the Southern Sweet. Lady, um, who's so sweet she's got no bad. You know, um, you you've got to break that candy shell, mm. especially in the southern world or southern sweetness. Um, and all way you do that's with law. Mm. You, have, you have to shatter. I mean, God does it. That you, you have to be shattered, and then you bring on the bomb. 
Yeah, that's why I said it's so, you have to be... S- <laughs> yeah, Travis, increase in gentleness, brother. This is a public... I need to be increasing. I know. No, and I do too. No, but it's a thing of where you don't, where it's not that... Um, like, like I was telling you the other day about uh, discussing hell with somebody. And you can talk about hell and they'll say, well, I just don't believe it. And then you can talk scriptures with them about it and they say, well, I just, I just don't believe it. And ultimately what it is, is you got to get them to say, say, well, I know that it's there, but I just don't believe God can do that. Mm. Right? So the problem is their unbelief. Um, but um, and then you got to say, well, what you're really disagreeing with is with God. It's not my opinion. Mm. What I'm giving you is the word. The one you're disagreeing with is God. And since the Lordship of Christ, He's the ultimate authority. Mm. So it really don't matter what either one of our opinions are. I care less what our opinions are. Mm. <laughs> what's what's the truth? Um, so 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 at the end of the day you gotta get them when you're evangelizing, is that they're not disagreeing with you. Mm. Yeah. They're not disagreeing with you. If, you. if you lift up you in that conversation, then you, you put too much flesh in it. Mm. Uh, That's why I said it's so important. You, maybe it's just what I'm saying, no, no, no. I was, I was just going to add to that. That's why it's so important you use the Word, the Word of God. Because then they walk away saying, like you mentioned, they can't say, well, I disagree with his opinion or his view. I disagree with the Word because this man, he knew the Word. He, he brought to my attention what the Bible teaches about these things. And I disagree with him. So... Yes. Um, I think sometimes, I know for me and for other people I've talked to, something that stops people a lot of times from sharing the gospel is wanting to say the perfect thing. They're afraid what they say is going to hinder someone from coming to Christ because they're not saying the right thing. Can you speak to that? As, um, that's be- yeah, that's beautiful. That's good. You know, it's interesting. What would do far more damage is not to say anything at all. And also, remember this. Ultimately, it, I'll never say the perfect thing. I will never say the perfect thing. It will always be tainted by sin. Every, you know, Even my most righteous deeds are filthy rags in God's sight. So my most articulate, even like with the Lady Heidi, I said it's the best gospel conversation I've ever had because it just went so smoothly. It was so faulty. It was a failure, an utter failure. And I look back and I just cringe. Oh, I just, I just want to, I want to say, what a failure! I said this, I should have said that. I didn't say, but God uses failures, and He, He, in His providence, uh, uses things that are very imperfect. So, I would say it does, it does more damage not to say anything than to say something and to maybe ill speak here, or to, to, and we're going to misspeak. You're going to, you're going to misquote like Deuteronomy. I hope Deuteronomy 35 actually says, "The Lord our God is a consuming fire, a jealous God." I really hope, but I'm a fallible man, and my memory is imperfect. So, honestly, you know, that, that can be, that could be demonic or satanic in its essence because it's of the devil in that it's trying to distract us from sharing the gospel. So, that's a wonderful, wonderful uh, question though, or thought. Um, so, speak, speak, you know, speak, speak, speak. Um, every, I, I, almost every time I get the opportunity to share the gospel, um, I have to force myself to do it because I'm going to be tempted constantly with things like that, but I've got to go along with it irregardless and God will still use it. So, and we can all think about um, our own conversions, and or maybe just even preaching that God has used to bless us, encourage us. Were those preachers perfect? Did they speak perfectly? No, no. But God used them. So that's wonderful, though. That's good. Well, it's a, it's a, I mean, I thought it was a good time. I was six, seventeen, when I was saved. You think how many times I've heard the gospel preached to you, and shared to you? Um, so just realize you're one of many. That God will, mm-hmm. will use, and then, and then one individual will mm-hmm. So it's a little bit of a salt. <laughs> and then another Christian will get more salt, some more salt, and with a combination of it, will get it. The Lord sees to it. So, you know, if you don't pour the salt out perfectly, And I think sometimes we have this romanticized view that we're going to share the gospel and someone's going to have like this epiphany and, you know, the gates of heaven are going to, oh, you know, there's going to be clouds are going to open up you know, like a Damascus road. Listen, I have never in my entire time evangelizing ever seen a single person saved. Never. 
Never seen a person converted. And there's, been a, there's, there's a sense in which that's been a discouragement. But also, I know that the, I ought not despise the day of small things. I preached the gospel many countless of times. I preached in many different cities and areas and gas stations and this and that and that and this. And uh, you know what? I never saw people converted. I've seen people convicted. I've seen people burdened. I've seen people attentive. And maybe it's, in the, maybe it's in the province of God that I not see it for pride's sake. But don't ever let that, again, be another reason to keep us from sharing the gospel. Because it might be so ordered that I'll, for the rest of my life, preach and never see someone come to Christ. But maybe the thousands of people did, and I just never saw it, or you know, one did, you know, or none. Uh, there, there's a story of a gentleman in Australia, and uh, he had, a, he had a, a shop where he did shoes. I think he made shoes. And he had a common practice that he would hand out gospel tracts. I think it was to people he would do business with, uh, customers. And uh, throughout his entire life, he did it faithfully. Never did he see any fruit of it. Just would hand people gospel tracts and, and spread the word. Um, Anyways, long story short, those tracks had made their way through various people. They had actually gotten to different people, not just the people who had received them initially from him. And uh, the Lord had ordered it that multiple people had been converted through his gospel tracks, and they, they traced back how they got the tract, how they ended up getting it to him. And one of them, I, I don't know, I forgot if it was one or multiple, found him on his deathbed. And they told him the story that multiple people had come to salvation through his tracting, and he never saw the fruit of it. So, let that itself be an encouragement, you know. I've handed out thousands upon thousands of gospel tracts. I haven't seen the fruit of it, and we might not. So, But then again, we might, and we pray. We pray for, for us to see the fruit of it. We pray to see God work. And we know this, irregardless if we see it or not, God has promised to work. And so that, that's enough for me. I go home every night, and I sleep very well. I don't have to worry. Thankfully, we're not Arminians. <laughs> Man, if I was an Arminian, ah. Uh, I would be stressed out, wouldn't I? I mean, if I was a man-centered, uh, altar-calling, you know, Arminian, free-willing you know, Arminian, that'd be just the scariest place to be in. But uh, I'm a Calvinist, staunchly Calvinist, and I believe in the sovereignty of God over the salvation of sinners. And that fuels my evangelism. So, uh, anyways, any, any other thoughts, questions? If not, we'll, we'll close in prayer. All right. Travis, can you close us? Gracious and Father, Lord, I thank you for the uh, witness that we've seen tonight. And that you're with us, dear Lord. Dear Lord, I pray that you would call all of us to spend time this week, dear Lord, in preparation for evangelism. Yes, sir. Dear Lord, to give us the scriptures that we need to study this week. Dear Lord, it's impossible to know all of the scriptures, dear Lord. But, but dear Lord, you are sovereign. And yes, sir. You control what people turn to this week and what they study. And the people you bring across their path to the Lord and the word that needs to go out to their friends and to their loved ones. The Lord who us to trust in your sovereign hand in each step that we take as we share the good news. Do Lord, I pray that you give people boldness to the Lord. Yes. And courage. Move the spirit of fear from them to the Lord. Be simply just by handing out tracts. Lord, that they may not be able to speak well. Lord, that they might not have a mind to be able to pull all the scriptures in, the Lord, to be able to speak. But the Lord, it is just written out for people, the Lord, as you've ordained. The Lord, yes, sir. In many ways, in many revivals and reformations that's occurred across this world, the Lord, it simply was through the printed word. So, the Lord, I pray that you would. Just use us as you see fit, dear Lord. Yes, sir. If you desire for us to see no conversions, dear Lord, because of, of our pride, dear Lord, may it not be. But dear Lord, as Lucas mentioned, Lord, you see all things and know all things. And yes, sir. Your spirit will move as it, as it wills in the lives of those that we come across. So, Lord, we trust in the wind each and every day that we see it, the Lord, really trust in your sovereign hand. Yes, Lord. The Lord, thank God in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Have a restful Lord's Day evening, everybody. Thank you all for attending.